We are live in Yukon, Oklahoma. All right. And we start off, um, you guys already know the, the um, you know, preparing yourselves. So we're going to prepare. You guys were praying earlier. So uh, this particular lesson two, we're calling Heed the Call. All right. And the, the Bible verse is finally be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Ephesians 6.10. So we're going to be using Ephesians 6, 10 through 18 as our, uh, our basis for our talk. And we start off with heeding the call. So before we get too far into it, we have to give you an encouragement. Because most people do not want to go into battle. Yeah. So there's a word of encouragement about going to battle. First of all, a soul that's deeply possessed by fear, dispirited with strong apprehensions of danger. Do you have things like that? You're not in much of, of a posture to be able to go into battle. And you, you know, it's usually uh, it's a time for being counseled and recognizing that, um, if you were in the military, you went through boot camp, and they do a lot of this in boot camp, preparing people mentally for battle. And sometimes people come in, they got a lot of fear in their life. They have, uh, there's an apprehension about, uh, I don't have any martial arts skills, and so on. And so that's a very common feeling. And when we start talking about spiritual warfare, spiritual battles, it's much easier to even get more worried because you become the target of the enemy. All right? And so we're going to tell you over and over and over as we continue in this study how to keep being prepared mentally, spiritually, and also an army that is in flight. <clears throat> By sudden alarm, if something happens and, and the army is, is like, oh, we gotta, we got to run from this area, it's very hard to get them back in order, to call them back together, all right, and to rally them to get back into the fight. So oftentimes that's what an enemy will do is attempt sudden type of uh, explosions, uh, large attacks to overwhelm the enemy, get them all frightened, so they start running. Satan does the same thing. Our enemy will attempt to do the same kind of strategies. As we go through this, we will continue to teach you about the strategies of Satan and how the, the Bible has prepared us for every single one of his strategies. All right? And God is with you, and God is not taken by surprise. Okay? So he's got, uh, we call that intelligence. He's got, uh, you know, advanced uh, intelligence on what the enemy is going to be doing. And it gives it to us also. So I just want to, you know, help you understand that um, there's a word of encouragement for you as we get ready for battle. I want to continue some more of these words. Let none of these or any other thoughts of fear, dismay, put you in a position where you feel like you don't have the courage that you need. All right. Uh, instead, Paul starts off with this verse 10, with be strong. And it was interesting, this morning's pastor uh, lesson out of uh, the book of Revelation was also strengthen yourselves. So we're hearing the same thing right now. It's not, timing of God is fascinating because you'll see he oftentimes will bring it up to you in different ways to encourage you. Be strengthened, be strong in the Lord, and it's not you that is got to be strong, though. It's strong in the Lord. So the Lord is the one that's going to perform the battles. The Lord is the one that wins those battles for you. It's not your personal martial arts training that you may have or not have. Although I encourage each and every one of you to have some basic self-defense training if you've never had done that before. Everybody, no matter what your age is, and but we're going to be talking about also preparing the spiritual martial arts. And what does that mean as well? So this is a heed to the call. 
And Paul's call is to all of us. He wants each and every believer to acquire divine strength. Not your normal strength, like this morning the pastors talk about how, you know, some people, to be strong, they have to exercise those muscles. But what's fascinating about what we're going to be studying here is that it's God himself that gives you that strength. But it's your knowledge, knowing the doctrine and the promises that actually fortifies that strength for you. Because you're going to be encountering spiritual forces of evil. And as you start to study this, it might become more prevalent in your life that you're battling against darkness. And if you've never, ever encountered darkness before, it could be, you know, a little bit frightening. And uh, we want to encourage each of you. And so part of my job is if throughout the week, something strange is going on, let me know. We'll put our shields together. You'll learn later about how these shields hook up. And these shields are designed to put out the flaming arrows of the enemy. So in this verse, he says, finally, be strong in the Lord. The word here for finally is an, is an idiom. And it means that um, from this point going forward, or we can also say uh, in the future, so he's saying, this point going forward or in the future, I want you to be strong in the Lord. And Paul is anticipating that believers, after they've gone through Ephesians chapters 1, 2, and 3, 4, and 5, and now you're in 6, that you have gained enough knowledge and doctrine that you're able to be strong. Okay, so... There's a thing, uh, God says that he's taken his blessings and he's placed them into a spiritual location that the enemy cannot get to. And doctrinally, we call that escrow blessings. So there are some blessings that each and every one of you have in escrow ready to be given to you. Okay, if you've ever purchased a home or bought something that was extremely expensive there's a third party that takes your promissory money. You promise you're going to fulfill your, your, your contract. They'll take that money and they'll put it into a safe place. We call it escrow while the deal is being worked out. And then there comes a point in time in which that money in escrow is then released. Well, God has placed into the heavenly bank an escrow account for each and every one of us. There are blessings there waiting to be used. So we're going to learn about that. There's also, uh, doctrinally speaking, something that's called a royal protocol plan. Royal because each and every one of you are royalty, even if you don't know that yet. If you are a born-again believer, you've been placed into the family of God, which is a royal family. And protocol means that there are rules that you will follow. There are certain methods, techniques, and rules that God's already planned out for you. And when you learn what they are, they're very um, powerful how things happen in your life and how you use the armor. So we'll be talking about that. And to get you ready for that, I gave you a handout earlier, and I titled it Ephesians Escrow Blessings and the Royal Protocol Plan. So you have a handout. And in the meantime, open up your Bibles to Ephesians, because we're going to use Ephesians to talk about this. Ephesians chapter 1. And so I'm opening my Bible now to that same area. And what I'm going to do now is I'm going to take you through the basics of what you should know you will have to go back and study this because there's a lot here. And we're not doing a study in Ephesians right now. But I'm going to give you the summary of what you need to know. And a handout I gave you gives you the verses for each of these um, special doctrines that you need to know. So, for example, 
Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. That's your escrow account. Every single blessing he has already prepared for us. Okay, so as you start to study Ephesians, you start to learn what they are. They're pretty incredible. The next one is in verse 4, <clears throat> excuse me, 4, and it says here, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world. So you've been chosen. It's not an accident. It's not an accident that you are a believer. You were chosen. Before the world was even created, God knew and chose. We won't get into all that today, but in the future, if we uh, decide to do a study in Ephesians, then we can go back and go in more detail. But right now, I'm just pointing them out to you. Verse 5 says you've been predestined. Now, predestination is confusing to a lot of Christians. You know, where's my free will at if, if I've been predestined? But actually, you're predestined in Christ. That means this, and this should really relieve you of any worries you might have about your free will. If you're in Jesus, you get the same destiny that Jesus has. You've been predestined. His destiny is he's the king. And you he's the king of kings and the Lord of lords. It's not talking about worldly kings and worldly lords. It's talking about each and every one of us. We are the ones that he's the king of us. We are kings and lords in his kingdom. Christians, they don't realize that they get the same destiny that he gets if you're in Christ. And verse 7, we, go ahead. Oh, all the way back to verse 3? All right, we'll go back to verse 3. That's okay, go ahead. I'm, a, I'm saying they are available to you. There are certain requirements that you will have to achieve to receive your blessings. Okay. They're not in escrow. They're, they're in escrow. Escrow gets released to you when you fulfill the, the actual parts of the requirements to receive the escrow. And, you're going to trust them. And, and as we go through this, we will see what these requirements are. Wonderful. And so uh, I know um, I probably should repeat back out loud what he's asking instead of just answering because we're recording this. I'm sorry. So he's asking, you know, uh, are these things available to us now? Uh, because I said that they're in heavenly places on reserve for each and every one of us. And my answer is yes, they're available as we fulfill the requirements to receive them. And some people, sadly, some Christians, I should say, some Christians, sadly, will never receive their blessings. They're in escrow. They'll go to heaven. They got their salvation. But there are extra things there he wanted to give to us that they won't receive. And we'll learn that later. And also our pastor is going to cover some of that when he talks about those who overcome get the following. Well, if you don't overcome, you don't get those out of the book of Revelation. So there are certain blessings on reserve for each of us. And as we go through this study, we'll learn what some of those are. And then if we decide we want to go back and learn all of them, then we'll have to study Ephesians, which we're not doing right now. So don't ask me too much details. <laughs> Because then I will just say, all right, we're in Ephesians, you know. Because <laughs> I've taught Ephesians a couple of times. And the last time I taught it, uh, it took, I think, a couple of years to get through it. So my daughter says it took us three years to get through it. She's right. I was trying to make it easy on us. <laughs> all right. So uh, we're going to go on to verse 7 now. And verse 7, uh, we're redeemed. And we have forgiveness. And um, so let me get to that verse in my Bible here. It says, in him, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace. And his grace has no limit. So the riches of his grace are unlimited riches of his grace. You are forgiven for everything, which is shocking to some people. Yeah. He paid the price for everything. Even the things I'm going to do in the future, they're already covered. 
right? So if we know that, now we can now focus on what's the protocol plan? What's he want us to do as believers? Instead of wallowing in self-pity about sin, repent and move on, okay? Strengthen yourselves. So let's go on to verse 11 now. And this one is you, each and every one of you have an inheritance. We have an inheritance. There is something that, uh, oh, and by the way, you may remember the story of the prodigal son who uh, he wanted his inheritance now, and then he wasted it. But notice he did receive his inheritance. The father didn't have to die first. So we're talking to Jewish customs. In America here, you don't get your inheritance until the person who's given it to you has passed away. But in Jewish culture, the inheritance was the wealth of the family. And at any time that the, um, the patriarch, the father of the family, wanted to give the inheritance out, he could. But it was considered rude if you wanted it before he passed away. Okay? So that, you know, that young son... And the story that Jesus tells, uh, the prodigal son was very, very rude to his father. But the father still loved him. All right? Well, you have an inheritance. You do not have to wait for uh, the, the inheritance is for now. It does. You don't have to wait to get to heaven to get your inheritance. That's the shocking part. And we'll find out more about that as we move forward into our study. So there's something in that inheritance that's yours that's pretty incredible. And the reason why we know we have that inheritance is because when you believe in the Lord, in verse 13, it says that you have been sealed with the Holy Spirit as a down payment. See, it's kind of like the escrow account where we got down payment here also. God wants us to know there's something extremely important about who we are and the wealth that we have in Christ that he sealed us so that even the enemy when they look upon you, they know, ah, you're one of the marked ones. You have a mark. You have, there's, it's kind of like in the old, old days, even up until about 1800s, uh, if you had an important letter that you want to send somebody and you don't want nobody else to get to it, and you want to make sure that they know that it hasn't been opened, they waxed it, hot wax, and then sealed it with a signet ring. Okay, my wife and I, our wedding bands are signet rings for our family. And so then they would seal it, and that's what the sealing is. That's the same word here. You have a signet ring on your life showing everybody else that you belong to God, including the enemy. The spiritual darkness can see that too. All right. So when I get done with this, you'll probably say, let's do Ephesians also. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Now, what's fascinating here is in verse 17, he tells us here some really cool stuff. It says here, uh, the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you the spirit of wisdom and of revelation in the knowledge of him. We have that. This is a, this is a spirit-inspired, Holy Spirit-inspired prayer for each of us that we receive God's wisdom and revelation about him. It's available to us. And look at verse 19. It says, And what is the immeasurable greatness of his power toward us who believe? Wow. Immeasurable power. The enemy cannot stand against you. you if you're in Christ and you know it, you can stand firm and the enemy will not be able to blow you over. You have an immeasurable power. We're going to learn about that in the study. All right. And notice verse 22 to 23 in verse one, chapter 1. It says, And he put all things under his feet. That's under the feet of Jesus. He put all things under his feet and gave him as the head over all things to the church. Jesus is the head of the church. Everything's under his feet. If he's the head and you're the body, everything is under your feet too. That should be a surprise to you. Wait, why does Satan get so much you know, power in my life when he should be under my feet? So we're going to learn more about that. 
how this armor will help you be in a position where you will know for certain that he cannot defeat you. You will defeat him. And as a member of the body of Christ, everything is under Christ's feet. That means everything is underneath yours also. And we don't normally think of it that way until we start to do a verse-by-verse -verse study and understand what the Greeks thought when they read this, or the Ephesians in this case. Well, let's go over to chapter 3. Oh, by the way, uh, chapter 1, verses 3 through 14, there's one sentence in the Greek. In the Greek, it's the world's longest sentence in literature. There's verse 3 through 14. So you, you take one breath and then read it all out loud in one breath. Because there are no periods in this. But for your Bibles, you all have periods because they know that you can't hold your breath that long. <laughs> okay. In case, in case you haven't had grammar, we were always told when I was growing up, you know when they have a period when you have to take a breath. <laughs> So I, I keep saying, well, then Paul must have, you know, he must have had a large lungs. You know? All right. Well, let's go over to chapter 3, and we'll start at verse 10. This is a, a, another, the second prayer in Ephesians. And this chapter uh, 3, verse 10 says that the wisdom of God has been made known to the angels through the church. <sighs> what? What does that mean? So that through the church, the manifold wisdom of God might be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places, the angels. Okay, you may not know this, but the angels, both the good and the bad, they both, both groups, are learning about God's wisdom by watching us. There are things that God has kept secret He's never revealed to the angels until we came along and he reveals it to them through us. We have a very, very important job and most Christians don't, don't even think about it. But there's a court case going on right now, if you're not aware of that. Satan's under trial. And that court case, there are witnesses being called in and revelations taking place. And the part of that is about the graciousness and the love of God is because Satan is accusing God of, of vindictively casting him out. And God says, well, look at these witnesses here. See how horrible they've been? But yet they've received the repentance and the love. Satan has never repented. Anyways, we'll go further. But I won't get into the whole story of that guy right now. Because next week we talk more about him. Okay. But the wisdom of God is being revealed through the church. And look at verse 16. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm one, one behind for you guys. There we go. Verse 16 now. There's a prayer here for us that we would be strengthened. And it says here, according to the riches of his, of his glory, he may grant you to be strengthened with power through your spirit in your inner person, your inner man, your inner woman. Okay, so we know Holy Spirit-inspired prayers, they happen. You look at this and you say, that prayer is for me. You will be strengthened by it. Let's go further. Why? Because look at verse 17. How am I strengthened? So that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you being rooted and grounded in love may have strength. And goes on. But Christ dwells in us. So we have the Holy Spirit. We have Jesus. We'll find out later that the Father also, the Trinity, dwells in us, which is shocking to the angels. Yeah, shocking to us. We just kind of take it for granted that these are just words. We don't even think much about it, but it's reality. Well, 18, the prayer is that we would know his love. There's no end to his love. There's no, you know, no matter the height of it, the breadth, width, the depth of it, there is, it's unlimited. And he wants us to know that love. And the word for know means to experience it. Experiential knowledge. All right, verse 19. That we be filled with his fullness. There is so much in that one verse that we could spend a whole year on it. Filled with his fullness. But we don't have a year. So you'll go back and do some more studying on your own. 
but I just want to kind of entice you with some of this. And the last one I'll come up with is, is a Bible verse that is just, it, it blows your mind when you really give it much thought. That's verse 20. Verse 20 says, Now to him who's able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think. And actually, I like it in the Greek, exceedingly abundantly above all that you can ask or think he's able to accomplish in your life. So these are all the things that you would have learned reading this book before you got to the armor. They're important that we know these things before we get to the armor. If you don't know these things, when you start to put on the armor, the armor's going to be a little bit heavy. It's going to be very heavy. As a matter of fact, the Roman armor, um, all by itself, was 60 pounds. And then you put the backpack on it because you got to carry your own stuff with you. And that was another 60 pounds. So you have 120 pounds. So you can't do it. You need the strength of the Lord. <laughs> all right. Anything I need to talk about answering these before I move forward? Because I've just given you the highlight. I'm hoping that you're thinking, I'm going to take this paper home and I'm going to look these up and think more about it. There's a lot here. All right. So let's continue heeding the card, uh, the call, I mean. So he says he wants you to be strong in that verse 10. And that word there is a word that means to put on yourself like, like a garment, like clothing. Put it on yourself daily. Like, like, like you put on clothes every day before you go outside, put on strength daily. Be strong. It's a daily thing. And the strength here is a particular kind of strength. It's deutimus. And this deutimus is a power that can resist other forces. Uh, we get the word dynamite from this word. And so deutimus, dynamite, it's, it's a power that Anything that comes against it is going to be blown away. Fun play on words. <laughs> All right. Notice something about this word. It's in the present tense. It denotes that um, you should expect this every day that you put it on. It's passive, meaning that God's not going to do it for you. you got to do it yourself. And it also is a command. It's an imperative. So you're being commanded daily to put on strength in the Lord. And he's not doing it for you. you got to do it. So the problem is, how do we do that? What, what, what do I do when you say i got to put on the strength of the Lord? You know, is that a mental, positive mental attitude or something? What is it all about? Well, we'll go a little bit further and we'll start to answer some of that. He says, put this strength on in the Lord, and the in the Lord here in Curio is it means that it's kind of like taking a ball around yourself, and you step into that ball, and we call a ball a sphere. So in the sphere of the strength of the Lord, you're stepping into the Lord's strength. Now, granted, you just now visualize some of this. So visualization and knowledge of doctrine is an important factor involved in this recognizing that you you get your strength from being in Christ and it's a daily spiritual power it doesn't come from within you okay so in other words if you have a positive mental attitude because you've been told hey a positive mental attitude will change things in your life yeah well it keeps you happy but it's not the power we're talking about here this power is not from you. You don't generate this power. Matter of fact, it can only be obtained through Jesus. Even Satan and the enemies that we were battling against do not have this kind of strength. All right. So how do we get it? The question comes up a second time here. How? By doctrine that's residing inside your heart. We've talked multiple times on the importance of the heart and the mind, the difference between the two. They're both a part of the soul. The mind is a part that 
uh, we receive the knowledge coming into us. Then we add our faith to it, and our faith and the Holy Spirit, it, it gets transferred over into the second lobe of the soul, which we call the cardia, the heart. And in the heart, it is available to be actionable. It has a launching pad. It's got power there in the heart. If it's not in the heart, it's only in the mind. We call it, well, you got head knowledge of the Bible, but it's not doing you any good because you haven't added your faith to it. That's why you can find people who've been in church for 45 years, they know a lot of the Bible, and they're still not saved. Head knowledge. Okay? We're talking about faith and combining your faith with what you know, and it gets moved into the heart. And once it's in the heart, now you can get the strength of the Lord. So, in other words, we say this almost every single morning that we meet. Study to show yourself approved. You don't understand. What? My mic went off? Thank you for telling me. It says low battery, of course. I'm going to talk louder. Because low battery means no battery. <laughs> but thank you for letting me know. All right, so... We talk about study to show yourselves approved. Most people think, oh, that just means I, I study so I can answer the Bible quiz questions. I can I have things that I could, um, they're superficial approvals is what I'm trying to bring out. But no, it really means when you go into battle, you know how to use your weapons. You have been trained. You have studied because you're going to have to show that you are going to be successful with what you know. And that's what I say when I say study to show yourself approved. That means every single time we have our lessons, you're going to be tested on it. And you may not even know that you were tested because you failed it so bad. Okay? <laughs> but God will give you more chances. And, and if you didn't pass it, he will bring it up to your attention again. Apply doctrine. What did you learn in Sunday school class? I learned to step out in the strength of the Lord, not myself. Pastor talked about this morning. Isn't it amazing what we talk about? He's already preset that up for us by those of us who attended the pastor this morning sermon. He says, you're not grabbing it and doing it with yourself. You're in the Lord. It's the Lord that's doing it. If you're doing it by yourself, your own strength, you're going to fail, and you're going to be miserable, and you're going to wonder, how come all this bad stuff keeps happening to me? Okay? We're going to train you in the armor how to be ready for that. Heed the call. So the power is an important power. Oh, that's funny. The light's coming across through that little balloon there. All right. So um, power, kratos. This power is a ruling power. This is not power like, like the strength of picking, picking up things. This is power as in an inner power of being able to rule, an authority. You've got Christ on your side. You have authority in your life, even if you don't know it. I already told you. Royal protocol. There are certain things you can do, and this is a part of it. By means of that inner ruling power, you would be strengthened. So it refers to having Bible resident in your heart. Coming right back to that. All right? So a believer can manifest God's power in their life when they follow God's truth. When you have doctrine in your heart. If you don't have doctrine in your heart, you can't do this. If it's only in the, in the mind and you haven't added faith to it, it's useless to you. Satan knows the scriptures. It's useless to Satan. Same thing for believers. You can study a lot, but if you don't add your faith to it, it's just words. All right. Am I yelling too much? Okay, now I want to make sure you folks in the back can hear my voice. Thank you. All right, so part of this is that this, the word might is also in that verse, verse 10. Ephesians uh, 6.10. Might, 
Uh, this is a power word also that's talking about the ability to do something. This is the ability of God in your life. When we get done with our study in, in the armor of God, you're going to find out that there are spiritual forces at work that have a hierarchy, and countering their hierarchy is what's in your life to counter each one of their hierarchies. We have multiple words for words power. Each one will correspond to also one of the darkness's powers and how we can overcome it. So you have nothing lacking, except maybe it's not in your heart yet. All right? So he says that this uh, might and power is his. Atos. It identifies that this belongs to Jesus. This is not my power. What I operate in can be extremely powerful, but it's not me. It's Jesus' power. And when I was a kid growing up, I became a Christian when I was 16 years old, and I hung out with a bunch of people that we call Jesus people. Don't know if you guys uh, remember the Jesus movement, Jesus people. And um, it was so funny because um, every time we did anything, we always said, Jesus is at work. He's the one that's doing this. We weren't doing it ourselves. And the church uh, in these modern times right now, you know, 50 years later, they are all about themselves. And we got to get back to focusing this Jesus. So this armor is all about Jesus also. And notice that our strength is in the Lord. It's obtained from the Lord. And it's an endowment, an ability from the Lord. In other words, evil cannot defeat divine strength. Evil cannot defeat you. When you know the schemes of the devil and you've got your armor on, you will easily defeat. And that's shocking to most Christians. What do you mean easily? Because they're no, they're no match for the power of God. So, Ephesians, I just now took each of those words, expound them on in talking about it. Now we'll show you what it looks like when you put it all together into that one sentence. In the future, keep on becoming strong in the Lord, even by means of the inner rule of his endowed power. So that's what's being said to you. And that's just the start before we even get into the armor. He's telling us all these really fantastic things that if you just meditate on that one verse, you're like, okay, so now going forward, every single day I put on the garment and I'm going to become strong in the Lord. Nothing can stand against me because I'm in Christ. That power all by itself is a secret. That's a secret. The world would like to know that. Okay, so attention. Christ Jesus has transmitted his power to believers through knowing Bible doctrine. He's transmitted that power to you. If you know those doctrines, I just gave you, you know, two chapters full. You go back, you study those, you get to know them. It's transmitted to you. Thus, it is Jesus' endowed power resident in the believer's soul, which becomes the Christian protocol how we live out our lives. The royal protocol is by having that doctrine in our hearts. And it provides us with daily strength so we will be able to stand up against the dark forces. All right, so let's talk about the application of it. I got about maybe another seven minutes or so left. So the application of this. Where is that battlefield? It starts in your mind and your heart. So we say it starts in the soul. Okay? You must know who you are in Christ. That means first proclaim that power against your own personal sins. And recognize you have to repent. Repentance is the beginning of everything. That's why we start off by saying rebound. Repent. Get yourself right. So I got that repent, rebound, 
1 John 1, 9. And so the challenge then is to do it daily. Uh, as Pastor uh, Brian said this morning, people get used to things and they just don't keep doing it daily. And after a while, they fall asleep. Wake up! <laughs> All right. Okay, so you got to go through your boot camp training. I'm going to uh, put them all up at once, and then uh, you have a paper from last week that has the boot camp training in it. Boot camp meaning this is what I require everybody to know before they put on their armor. I've jumped past this, and we're going into our armor first, but if you want to go back and do some boot camp training, each of these verses up here, these are things that should be present in your life. Unity, holiness, love, Light, wisdom, praise, and harmony. All right. Let's see. I may have to stop here. We got, well, we, we still got five minutes. I think I'll press on. I got people coming in here at about, at about 12 or so. They're going to come in the back area because they're preparing for something for in here. But let, let's see how much we can get done. Should I press on? All right. I'll press on. All right. Uh, verse 11 says, put on, instead of wake up, put on, envelope yourself. And it's in the middle voice, which means that you're going to do that yourself, voluntarily yielding yourself to obedience. I like how the pastor's always saying, these, these things that we do, we do it out of obedience. All right. Put on, out of obedience, the whole armor. All the weapons. That's what the whole armor actually means. If you were literally to look at it in the Greek, it's not armor. He's saying put on all the weapons. And if you're a martial artist, you might have all kinds of weapons all over your body. And um, in this case, the armor, every piece of armor in the Roman uh, armor was considered to be part of his weapon. And so we'll learn about that. The Roman soldier... The warrior refers to the full armor of a heavily armed soldier. That's the helmet, the breastplate, the belt, the shoes, the shield, the sword, 60 pounds of equipment. I consider that 60 pounds of equipment to be the Bible doctrine I'm holding in my heart. <laughs> That's how I see it. So all the armor, the completeness of it is being emphasized. We're not to have any lacking of the equipment. You don't go into battle with your helmet off. You don't go into battle with the breast shield off. You don't go into battle with your belt not there and your pants falling down. Okay? <laughs> Although it wasn't that kind of belt. I'm just having fun. All right. <laughs> so it is the armor of God. God is the designer is what that's telling you. The armor of God. It means he designed it for you. He designed it knowing you're going to be fighting against his fallen angels. And what will it take for you to defeat them? I designed for you particular weapons that will defeat them, is what he's telling you. So that you may be able, that you may be able, well, every member of the Royal Combat Legion, that's what you are. You're a member of the Royal Combat Legion, and you're given an ability from God. And that ability is to stand. See, notice he's not telling me to strike out. He's not telling me to be the person who's being offensive. He's telling me, stand. Stand firm with all my armor on. Because he is going to do the battle. Okay? So that's what's happening there. Hold your ground is what it says. It's a present tense. It's a present tense reality despite constant assaults. Victory is contingent upon wearing and using that whole armor. And we're going to stop with this part right here. It's the wiles of the devil. The, uh, the wiles of the devil is talking about the tactics, the tricks, the cunning arts of the enemy. It's a classical Greek term. It described deliberate uh, actions from a wild animal who's tracking and pursuing its prey. We are to know 
Satan's way of tracking and how he's targeting us as his prey. Or as the pastor said this morning, the devil is a roaring lion seeking out to devour. We will have our armors on and kill that lion. I'm going to stop here. Next week we'll pick it up and we study next week who is the enemy before we get our armor on. Father, I thank you very much that you've given us the full armor to put on. You designed it for us. And along with that, we have all these fantastic escrow blessings. We have the fact that you have infiltrated us, in, in, immersed into our bodies, your spirit, your son, yourself, so that we can stand up against the enemy. I pray, Lord, that you be glorified in this study and that next week when we return, we'll have some very good stories about the success we've had in defeating the enemy in our lives and that you would be glorified in all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.